The early life of the quiet Prince Albert was overshadowed by his gregarious elder brother and heir to the throne, Edward. And to discharge my duties as king, as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. But following Edward's shocking abdication of the throne and Albert's sudden ascent, he endeavoured to fulfil his duty to his country, to win over his public, overcome personal health issues, and deal with the chaos wrought by the Second World War. Bertie, who became known as King George VI, would become a symbol of hope and solidarity for a country and a world in crisis. Prince Albert was born in the winter of 1895, the second eldest son to King George V and Mary of Teck. Born six years before the death of his great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, the shy prince, known as Bertie to his family, grew up in the shadow of his elder brother, Prince Edward. George VI was quiet as a child. He had a good relationship with his other siblings, but he wasn't as excitable as his older brother, Edward. Albert was a more withdrawn figure, closer to his father than his other brothers. And in keeping with his father's interests, he enjoyed the quiet life away in the countryside, out of the public eye. George VI was the opposite of his brother Edward growing up. He was Albert, he was known as Bertie. He was shy, he was retiring while his brother was outgoing. He wasn't as good looking as, Ed as Edward, he wasn't as well dressed, he wasn't as charismatic, he didn't have the same success with women. Edward's relationship with his younger brother Bertie was very warm when they were younger boys. There was very, very, very little between them in terms of their age, and they grew up best of friends. However, as the, the two men grew older, uh, life became a bit more difficult. George had a very specific way that he wanted to live. He was much more of a kind of private figure. Uh, he was more withdrawn in terms of his public image. He didn't have the, the sort of the charisma uh, and the glamour that was possessed uh, by his older brother Edward. He didn't have a great deal of confidence. Uh, and the reason why he didn't have a great deal of confidence was because he had a stammer. Now, psychologists have, have sought to try and explain um, the, the stammer in relation to the, the fraught relationship that the, the royal children had had with, with the king, with their father, George V, growing up, and that uh, the, young, the young Bertie growing up had, had been almost terrified by his, by his father uh, and the expectations that his father had imposed on him. George V was very much an old-fashioned patriarch. He was somebody who believed not just in the idea of spare the rod and spoil the child, but also in the very Victorian idea that children should be seen and not heard. So of his four sons, the two eldest, later Edward VIII and George VI, had a very difficult relationship with him because he was this cold figure and, and his wife Mary was cold as well. And it was very much a sense that everyone was brought up in a way to understand duty and the idea of duty as the central tenet of what he was suspected to do as a royal prince, something that he laboured home intensively. He didn't have a great deal of confidence. He wasn't as outgoing as, as other members of his family and a bit more withdrawn. I think in that respect, we can understand why later on he would be a more reluctant figure when it came to becoming king. As a character, he was a much less likely king than Edward ever was because he was somebody who didn't seem to be very comfortable around people. By 1920, the 25-year-old Prince Albert would start looking for a wife and would find her in his longtime friend, Lady Elizabeth Bowes-Lyon. 
Bertie found uh, his closest confidant and greatest supporter in his, in his wife, Elizabeth. After a number of unsuccessful attempts to woo her and, and propose marriage to her, she eventually consented uh, and agreed to, to, agreed to marry him. There was some talk at the time about whether she was in fact uh, more interested in his older brother, Edward, Prince of Wales, and that was one of the reasons why she originally turned Bertie down. Uh, nevertheless, she would get married to Bertie. They would embody everything that was best about the monarchy in this period, in that they, they, they presented themselves as very dutiful figures. They, they went out into public life. Uh, they toured towns and cities. They opened hospitals. They did all that was expected of royals of their generation. The couple were married on the 26th of April, 1923, in Westminster Abbey and became the Duke and Duchess of York. His relationship with his, his wife, Elizabeth Bowes Lyons, who later became Queen Elizabeth, was, well, does not sentimentalise these things, but it was a very happy relationship. The two of them had known each other for, for many years. They were very much in love. It was a very conventional match. There was no question that they would get married. They got married and had two daughters. And essentially, it gave him a stability and, and a happiness that he'd always wanted. I suppose these days we call it anxiety that he suffered from, which led to the stammer. And she knew that he had this, and she thought the best way of dealing with it was to deal essentially by removing him from situations he wasn't comfortable in. She believed that he should be, if you like, wrapped up in a kind of cotton wool. But she was also somebody who loved him and was keen that he be kept away from the more taxing aspects of royal life. he wed the lovely Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon in the wedding of the season. Together they toured the various dominions of the empire and seemed supremely happy. As the Duke of Chant, without the heavy sword of kingly responsibilities hanging over his head, young George led a carefree life. Possessing the common touch, he soon became a beloved figure in English life. George VI, when he was a younger man, was devoted to his, his wife Elizabeth, the, the Queen, and to their children, Elizabeth and Margaret. He was not somebody who was seeking the limelight. He was not somebody who wanted to have his, his name up in lights. He was somebody who would have much preferred a quiet, simple family life. And I think you can see that he was a, he, he served in, in World War I. He was somebody who was the first member of, of, of his own family to have done so, to have served on active service. He had a great respect for the armed forces, and you can see but if he never had become king, he would have been one of those figures within the royal family who was always well-liked, whose debilitating stammer meant that public speaking was a nightmare for him. But in private life, he was absolutely fine. He wasn't somebody who was affected by it to the extent that he was publicly. In January of 1936, King George V died suddenly at home in Sandringham House. The monarch's 25-year reign had seen the country through the First World War and the founding of the House of Windsor. George V was a, a king who had to deal with a series of crises uh, that uh, coloured his reign, ranging from the First World War uh, to the rise of communism and fascism, the Great Depression, uh, and uh, la latterly uh, the fragmentation of the empire. Uh, he was a king who had to move with the times. He did so by presenting himself as a figure of duty, who took his responsibilities as king very seriously, who put the nation ahead of his own desires. I think it's fair to say that Prince Edward hated his father. I think it's fair to say that he despised him for being this anachronistic, stuffy figure and that he he absolutely despised the idea that his father had been pushing him into this unsuitable garment, if you like, and that the garment of monarchy did not fit very well with him. He was a man who preferred dressing up in Savile Row suits to ceremonial robes. So I think that his loathing of his father was something that stayed with him all his life. It was said by 
Tommy Lassell's before Edward became king, but I hoped that he would fall off his horse while racing and break his neck. And Stanley Bolton, the Prime Minister, said, God help me, so do I. The idea was, was that in the highest echelons of society, whether it was social, whether it was political, ecclesiastical, anything else, nobody wanted him to become king because they saw him as a complete liability. But also, and I think this is crucial, somebody who could not be governed. Because up to that point, and I suppose subsequently as well, there has always been the tacit understanding that the king governs by consent. The king is a constitutional monarch who rules within the boundaries set down by the British constitution. He does what he's told, in other words. Edward had no interest in doing what he was told. He wanted to be a reforming monarch. He wanted to be somebody who was going to tear up the certainties that his father and grandfather and great-great-grandmother had governed by. And because of this, he was seen as somebody who was incredibly dangerous. But of course, what do you do with a troublesome king? You can't just kill them, after all. It has been an ancient tradition of the British monarchy that the new sovereign should send a message to his people. Science has made it possible for me to make that written message more personal and to speak to you all over the radio. I feel that his death is not only an overwhelming grief to my mother and to us, his children, but that it is at the same time also a personal loss to you all. The vast crowds speech to say that he reigned in the hearts of his people. It now falls upon me to succeed him and to carry on his work. I am better known to most of you as the Prince of Wales, as a man who has had the opportunity of getting to know the people of nearly every country of the world. And although I now speak to you as the king. I am still that same man whose constant effort it will be to continue to promote the well-being of his fellow men. May the future bring peace and understanding throughout the world. And may we be worthy of the heritage which is ours. God save the king! King Edward VIII ascended to the throne upon the death of his father, King George V, in January of 1936. Though the young and fashionable king was much beloved by the public, both palace and parliament were in agreement that he was not well suited to the job. He was enormously popular with the people. He was somebody who was seen as a completely different kind of king to every other, because he was seen as somebody who was very accessible. And the, the glamour that he'd had as, as a younger man persisted. There was a real sense that he was the first king who had ever really come down to the level of the public. And a real sense that he was the first person who could walk amongst them and actually be regarded as a normal, everyday figure. Edward VIII saw kingship essentially as, first of all, a means of enriching himself, Secondly, a means of maintaining his relationship with Wallace Simpson. And thirdly, arguably, as a means of furthering the Nazi cause within Britain. The King had been having an affair with the twice-divorced American socialite, Wallace Simpson. In the year he became King, Edward VIII proposed to marry Wallace, an event which triggered a constitutional crisis across the British Empire. When it became clear that Edward was thinking about abdicating the throne in order to marry Wallace Simpson, there was an enormously mixed reaction. You could essentially summarise it like this. The middle classes were horrified and disgusted because they saw the, the king having this relationship with a married woman, indeed a divorced woman, something that was completely unacceptable. The working classes didn't think anything of this. They thought it was absolutely fair enough. That they loved the king, they wanted him to be happy, and they were very, very keen that he remain on the throne. So it really split the country down the middle, and of course the upper classes were faced with this completely different idea, whereby 
they didn't condemn him from a moral perspective, they condemned him more from a perspective of being selfish enough to having put the country in this constitutional crisis. Brings him strong support from those who look up to him. There are differences of opinion too. Here are some of the views expressed. My opinion of the king, he should marry who he loves. He's been a good chap to the working class. That's my opinion of him. Quite apart from the fact that she isn't of noble blood, Mrs. Simpson has twice been in the divorce courts. To my mind, that completely rules her out as Queen of England. The nation is behind him, and we must not lose him. Edward always knew that abdication was a possibility. If we go and look at the diaries of his friends and associates earlier on in 1936, when they're talking about the affair before it's become public news, we know that Edward was already considering this idea that he might have to abdicate in order to marry the woman he loved. However, this was not plan A. He would have preferred to stay as king. This was a role he cared about deeply, that he wanted to play, and he wanted to marry the woman he loved. Ultimately, he was pushed towards option B, which was ultimately giving up the throne in order to marry Wallace. There's always been a romantic way of looking at the abdication crisis, is that Edward had acted in a way which, on the one hand, was appallingly entirely selfish. On the other hand, it was a way that has torn up centuries of precedent. All of his forebears had essentially known that to be king was something that you did as, as a duty, your personal feelings didn't really matter. So what he said was actually, no, my feelings and my happiness are more important than my being king. So I think people responded to that, and I think that the public had this sympathy for him. George VI, or Bertie as he was known, was absolutely terrified at the idea of becoming king. It was something that he'd never wanted. He had a debilitating stammer which meant that any kind of public speaking was nearly impossible for him. And it was com with complete fear that he watched the, the rise of the abdication crisis because he did not want to be king. He wanted to have a quiet, blameless life as a husband, a father, somebody who was a royal prince who was stammered his way through speeches he had to give, but he never ever wanted responsibility of actually ruling. And so he was looking at his brother and begging him not to abdicate, but Edward wasn't interested because his attitude was very bluff. It was to pat his brother on the back and say, never mind old man, you'll do this much better than I ever did. So when he became king, it was with an almost impossible set of expectations. How on earth do you follow somebody who has not just been this popular trend-setting figure, but he was get given up before and abdicated. I mean, how do you follow that? The majority of the public who had not known anything about the possibility of his abdication even two weeks before were absolutely horrified and absolutely devastated because of the idea of losing this young, popular, charismatic king. And when he made his abdication speech from Windsor Castle on the evening of 11th December 1936, there was, people were listening to it all over the country and they were weeping. It was a huge national moment because no king had ever abdicated before. And the fact that he was doing so for love, or at least what appeared to be love, made people feel this was a great sentimental passion. Has ceased to reign over Great Britain and the British Empire. He announced his decision to abdicate in a farewell broadcast heard by 150 million people around the world. The radio message put an end to the crisis in England that began when the king announced his marriage to an American divorcee, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. Parliament passed a special bill legalizing the abdication. constitutionally possible for me to speak. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support 
of the woman I love. And now we all have the new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. George VI was desperate not to become king. He was absolutely terrified by responsibilities of what would happen. But when he became king, he accepted it. He accepted that it was his responsibility and that it was something that he would have to deal with. But in the end, the coronation went absolutely fine. And the thing was, was that Churchill was watching it with his wife Clementine. And he said, after he'd seen the king crowned, you're quite right, it could never have been the other one. And I think the idea of George as the rightful king and Edward's reign as being a kind of strange anomaly was proved to many people by the fact the coronation was a success. The third and final king to reign in the year of three kings. The shy Bertie was thrust to the forefront of the royal family and with him his wife became queen and his two young daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret, became next in line to the throne. It's extraordinary when you think about it that one year saw three kings of England, George V, Edward VIII and George VI. But I think what's very interesting also is they were completely different kinds of people. George V was the last of the Victorians. He was this stern, unbending, old-fashioned ruler. Edward VIII was the first modern monarch. He's somebody who probably bears more relation to the monarchy today than he did to his own time. He was somebody who prized personal happiness, personal fulfillment, and what he wanted to do over any concept of duty, any concept of conventional kingship. Then George VI is something else altogether. He was somebody who was completely ill-equipped for the job, which he never thought he'd have to do. He was somebody who was terrified by the responsibilities that came along with it. But what he had, which served him exceptionally well later, was first of all his father's sense of duty and his father's sense of the monarchy as something sacred. But he also had the ability to listen to people, which his brother never did. And that was what was so crucial. Nineteen thirty-six was the year of three kings. It was a year that greatly unsettled the British monarchy. Given how popular Edward had been, after he left, there was a great sense of disappointment and a cloud uh, hanged heavy over uh, the British monarchy. And and actually, George the Sixth, the new king, he was really overshadowed uh, by his brother, now titled the Duke of Windsor, uh, through the the early years of his reign. Um, he had to do much to win back the loyalty and affection of the greater British public. The public didn't really want George VI as king because they were largely enamoured of his brother. And because he wasn't seen as a charismatic or stylish figure, they were disappointed by him because Edward VIII was, to many British people, like a movie star. He was somebody who was seen as this incredibly exciting figure. And George VI was not even a you know, rep theatre star. He was somebody who was seen as a bit glum, a bit drab, a bit lacking in any kind of glamour. So he knew this. I mean, he knew that he wasn't like his brother. He knew he was never going to be somebody who could stand up and have people cheer as soon as they saw him. But what he was trying to do was to try and measure the nature of kingship, the nature of monarchy, with his own personal failings and his own personal qualities. And I think that what he understood far better than his brother was that the symbolic representation of monarchy gives you a kind of 
cloak, which when you're wearing it, you, you feel it invulnerable. George VI uh, approached his role as monarch seriously uh, with a sense of duty and diligence. He, he sought to emulate the best qualities of his father's reign, uh, notably emphasizing how he was putting his life uh, and his, his sense of duty ahead of all else, that he was a public servant, uh, that he would continue in the vein of his father uh, trying to support Britain and the empire. And this image of him was of course in direct contrast with his brother, who had put personal fulfillment uh, ahead of national duty. Bertie had suffered from a stammer from childhood, but it was massively worse and exacerbated by his responsibilities when he reached adulthood because he would have to give speeches. And he hated it. He hated it because he felt completely ill-equipped to do so. And he would actively try and avoid opportunities of doing so because he felt embarrassed. The problem is, is that what he realized, especially when his father was alive, was that you can't duck these responsibilities. And so he had these horrendously embarrassing experiences where he would go and address for kind of low-grade events that you needed a member of a royal family to be at. And he'd often find himself making noise rather than a conventional speech, which is why he needed to have a speech therapist who could actually help him. So the speech therapist that he hired, or rather was hired for him by his wife, was this man called Lionel Logue, who was an Australian. And Logue was very unconventional because he didn't believe that the way of dealing with speech therapy was to be formal about it. He dealt with, with the king, who he, he called Bertie informally, as if they were friends, as if they were working on the same level. And the film The King's Speech offered a fictionalised account of this, and it's, it's broadly accurate in what it suggests, that there was this friendship that arose between them with some minor event. Would that be agreeable? Of course. Yes, and that would be the full extent of your services. Shall I see you next week? I shall see you every day. He managed to get uh, Bertie going in terms of, of making public addresses. Uh, Bertie would practice day in, day out uh, for at least an hour uh, on strengthening his muscles around his vocal cords uh, in order to try and gain a, a greater sense of confidence and control over his voice. The speech therapy was very effective for Bertie in that he did gain in confidence. Notably, the, the impediment would never fully go away. Bertie would continue to stammer. But nevertheless, he became a much more confident and, and competent public speaker than he had been before. Cannot long be separated. It did well that we have, in one of the world capitals, a visible reminder of so great a truth. For without freedom, there can be no enduring peace, and without peace, no enduring freedom. The Queen and the Princesses come out to welcome their guests in Windsor Great Park. And for almost the last time before they again disperse to the ends of the earth, the Dominion and Colonial representatives who have attended the coronation take part in a royal ceremony. And of all the brilliant gatherings of the past few months, probably the memory of this one will outlast all the others. For led by His Majesty, each of the distinguished guests is to plant an oak tree, one for every component part of the empire. And henceforth, this spot in Windsor Great Park is to be called Coronation Grove. as the years will lift its branches skywards, they will be a living memorial in rustling greenness to this happy first year of a new reign. His relationship with his father had been very different to his brother's relationship with his father because he was much more similar to George V in terms of temperament and in terms of character than his brother was. He believed in duty. He agreed with George V that the monarchy had to be maintained by any means possible. And that the best means of maintaining the monarchy was to accede to any conventional ideas of duty. His brother did not agree with this. But, but 
George VI, when he became king, knew exactly what his duty was. He hated it, but he would never have dreamt from shirking it. Greenwich proudly welcomes royal visitors, including Queen Mother Mary, who comes to see the opening of the National Maritime Museum. The crowd cheers King George and Queen Elizabeth and the 11-year-old Princess Elizabeth as they're welcomed to the museum, the first of its kind in Britain. When he became king, he accepted it. He accepted it. It was his responsibility and that it was something that he would have to deal with. And the person that he had as his counsellor was Walter Monckton, who had also been a VIII's counsellor. Monckton was a lawyer who understood how things worked, and he was a very decent man. So the first thing that George VI did as king was to knight Walter Monckton. And he did it in his, in his own private home in Piccadilly. And he said to Monckton as he was knighting him, well, Walter, I didn't do that very well, but it's the first time I've done it. And you can look at most of his reign up to the beginning of World War II as essentially that being a microcosm of it. You can see that he may not have done it very well, but it was the first time he'd done it. And although there are people who sneered at him, such as the diarist Chips Channon, for lacking glamour, for not being a charismatic figure, for his stutter, he was somebody who was trying his very best. And I think that's what you can see the king as being, somebody who was trying to be like his father, not like his brother. The memorial seems to me finally conceived and finally executed. It is fortunate also in the position it occupies. Standing as it does against the background of the castle, reminding us of the long and continuous history, if I may speak, for a moment of him in whose honor this memorial has been erected. And let me only say that to me personally, the memory of my father will always bring the inspiration of a high On the morning of 3rd of September, 1939, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain addressed the nation by radio broadcast. With the failure of the German government to withdraw their troops from Poland, the UK was now at war with Nazi Germany. Only three years into his sudden ascent to the throne, George who was still seeking to gain the favor of his people, would now face a Second World War, this time as king. The day that war was declared against Germany was uh, a great moment of, of sadness uh, and concern for the British public. They understood why this point had been reached, that Hitler had time and again broken promises, uh, and as a result, uh, Chamberlain and Chamberlain's government had been forced to declare war on Germany. In this moment of crisis, the British public, I think, were looking for, for leadership not just from the government, but also from the British royal family. Uh, they were looking for reassurance that everything would be okay and that the nation would get through this moment of peril. In this grave hour, and perhaps the most faithful in our history, I send to every household of my people, both at home and overseas, this message, spoken with the same depth of feeling for each one of you, as if I were able to cross your threshold and I speak to you myself. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war.
the masters of our fate. Edward turned up in Britain again in late 1939, uh, just after the war had started, and uh, royal courtiers, George VI and the British government, uh, are quite anxious that he be given some kind of official role outside of Britain so that he's not overshadowing uh, George VI. Um, he's sent to France, and there his role is to, to join uh, with, uh, with British military operatives inspecting France's milita military preparations for war. So he goes out to the Maginot Line, and he's looking at French defences uh, and checking whether the French are prepared for the, for the oncoming uh, German attack. Now, more recently, uh, one of his uh, biographers has actually suggested that Edward was gathering intelligence on the, the French military prepara preparations and that because he was quite indiscreet and he, he'd often meet with uh, representatives from uh, other, other nations, he let it be known that the French were ill-prepared and that that information got back to Nazi Germany and that they planned their attack on France accordingly. Despite the recent step-up of Nazi air raids over England, the King and Queen continue their war duties. Here they check production at this vital coal mine in Wakefield, now using the first mine labour to be conscripted in England. Meanwhile in London, the rest of the royal family carries on. Princess Elizabeth, seldom photographed, and Princess Margaret Rose attend a wedding at Westminster Abbey. The British royal family were not that popular during the Second World War, and there's a key reason for this. This was a moment of austerity, of rationing, of controls, of blackouts, where ordinary members of the public, where civilians were suffering hardships, where they couldn't access uh, ordinary foodstuffs, uh, where normal opportunities were closed down to them. And there, there was quite a lot of antipathy and anger towards uh, sort of elite sections of society who seemed to be able to continue with their lives uh, in normal ways. So it was crucial that the, the British royal family be seen as, as though they are suffering uh, because of this war as well. And the bombing of Buckingham Palace in that respect represented an opportunity to demonstrate that royalty, that crown and people were suffering together. Of the 500 German planes that came over that day, more than one third were shot down. In the 28 days of terror, from September 7th to October 5th, the Nazis dropped 50 million pounds of bombs on the city, killed 7,000 helpless civilians, and wounded 10,000 more. Bombs fell on Buckingham Palace. Westminster Abbey. The Houses of Parliament. Fleet Street, the center of the news. St. Paul's Cathedral. Buckingham Palace was bombed several occasions in, in World War II. The most spectacular one came relatively early in, in the war, when bombs landed sufficiently close to George VI and to Queen Elizabeth and to their private secretary, Alec Harding. But if it hadn't been for a couple of minor bits of chance, they almost certainly would have been killed. And it's very interesting to see this because whoever bombed Buckingham Palace knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly which parts of the palace the King and Queen would have been in. They knew exactly where to hit it. So there was clearly somebody working off some kind of intelligence, which was not intelligence that the general public would have had, and it's certainly not intelligence that Nazi Germany would have had. And the question that you have to ask is, how would you have got that intelligence, or were it not for fact? There was somebody who was at loose who would have been able to tell people exactly if you wanted to bomb Buckingham Palace and kill my family, 
this is how you do it. And of course, the question is, did Edward actually want to see George VI and the Queen killed? I, th I don't know is the answer to that, because on the one hand, he didn't like his brother, he was angry with his brother, but was he actually a traitor? I don't know, but what I think you can say is that his acts, even if they were not committed with intentional treachery, certainly added up to treachery. The King and Queen were exceptionally nearly killed and it was just a stroke of luck that, that they weren't. I mean, at one point, windows had been left open that probably wouldn't have been left open under normal circumstances. If the windows had been shut, they would have smashed into a thousand pieces of glass probably would have killed everyone in the room. After the palace was bombed, they were both absolutely terrified. The King wrote in his diary that he couldn't quite believe what had happened and that he was very, very lucky to have escaped. But days later, he's, he's still writing, I look outside and I can't forget seeing the bomb. And it's quite clear that it had a kind of traumatic effect on both of them. What was very interesting was that, especially after Buckingham Palace was bombed and the King and Queen went out into the East End to see that they'd been bombed, and the Queen famously declared, I'm glad we've been bombed because it makes me think I can look the East End in the face. There was a real sense of the traditional bounds coming down, a real sense that they were all in it together. The King and Queen were very keen to emphasise a narrative that they, the royals, and the British public at large were all in this war together. There was, a, there was a sense of shared sacrifice that united crown and people. What you saw with the king and queen was that they really were cheek by jowl with their subjects. I mean, they knew they could have been killed just as anyone else could have been. And although, of course, they did all these things with an eye to publicity, it was also something that they genuinely believed, they genuinely were sincere about the idea of wanting to be standing alongside their subjects who had been bombed, who were going through the same things they were, because obviously they knew they were just as likely, if not more likely, to be bombed than anybody else. Once again, Londoners who have known nights of terror before return to their bombed out homes. Britain's beloved monarchs are on the scene a short while after, again demonstrating a human sympathy for their subjects whose courage has never yet been shaken. But King, Queen, or humble citizen, all veterans of the Blitz, demonstrate once more that London can still take it. What, what George VI realised in World War II was that it was a conflict like Britain had never known before. It was a conflict which was going to be fought not just in terms of battlefields and across the world, but it was also going to be fought by the media. It was going to be fought in recorded speech, it was going to be, film, it was going to be fought in newsreels. It's very important that you had to look the right way, because every time that he was being filmed, it was something that was being distributed around the world. And a lot of Britain's allies, or putative allies, such as America, were looking at Britain, especially after the fall of France in 1940. The questions that they were asking are, do we let Britain stand alone? Do we let Britain fight on their own? Or do we actually try and help them? Is this worth our getting involved in? So George was aware that in addition to being his country's king, he was also acting as a kind of global ambassador. He was able to say, I have to be the king that Britain needs, both in a symbolic way, I have to be the person who can be in the newsreels, who people can feel inspired by, but also in a practical way. I mean, he was somebody who he, he understood from a minutiae of involvement. He was able to participate in this thing, which only came out quite recently, this sort of MI5 double cross operation, whereby he was being filmed for newsreels, these non-existent plants, all of which were designed for the Germans to believe that the D-Day would be happening somewhere different. And he enjoyed all that. He enjoyed the subterfuge, he enjoyed the sense that he was doing something worthwhile. Outside the general's caravan, the king held an investiture, decorating men honoured for bravery in battle. But he also enjoyed the sense that he was actually making a difference, because he was a king who was getting involved in a way that very few of his predecessors ever had. He was actually being asked by military leaders both from Britain and America what do you think we should do? And for somebody who was not a naturally outgoing figure, it was a very difficult experience for him. But in fact, as the, as the war went on, he found himself taking on an active role in terms of making decisions and liaising with people at the very, very highest levels. And he found himself becoming almost a military leader in and of his own right.
visits Allied headquarters in North Africa and spurs invasion rumors against a jittery Axis. It's a secret and spectacular flying trip for the British monarch. He sees Allied troops preparing for assault on Europe. This is part of the War of Nerves. Another visitor who unnerves the Axis. In Tunis, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, en route home from his latest Washington conference, inspects American soldiers. In London, Britain's King and Prime Minister receive pledges from 14 governments for a fight to the finish, and Churchill denounces the Axis new order. It is upon this foundation that Hitler, with his tattered lackey Mussolini at his tail, we cannot yet see how deliverance will come, or when it will come. But nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged, and if need be, blasted from the surface of the earth. The sound of British Spitfires came howling across the sky. The first enemy took one look and remembered an urgent appointment. Like meteors, the Spitfires came sweeping in pursuit with a hundred miles an hour in hand. And to the Scottish countryside came a new sound. The British Isles and their approaches. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The enemy who drove all Europe into war has been finally overcome. But at this hour, when the dreadful shadow of war has passed far from our cars and homes in these islands. We may at last make one pause for thanksgiving and then turn our thoughts to the tasks all over the world which peace in Europe brings with it. First, and let us remember those who will not come back. Their constancy and courage in battle, their sacrifice and endurance in the face of a merciless enemy. Let us remember the men in all the services, the women in all the services who have laid down their lives. We have come to the end of our tribulation and they are not with us at the moment of our rejoicing. Rejoicing and pageantry in London on England's national day of prayer and thanksgiving for final victory. Leading the colorful spectacle is the royal family driving to divine services at historic St. Paul's Cathedral. Ancient ceremony marks the procession of the monarchs who are followed by more royalty. The exiled King George of Greece and another exile, Yugoslavia's King Peter. Then Winston Churchill, now leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. And Prime Minister Attlee, successor to Winston Churchill, as all London hails Churchill, the man whose leadership made this day possible. In addition to the celebrations, he knew that there was going to be trouble ahead because 
Britain was not a country at the end of World War II that was triumphant, although the, the war had been won. There was going to be enormous economic and social privation, there had been millions of people had died, it was not going to be a time of ease. And I think that what he understood was that despite being king, he'd come to understand the daily lives of his subjects sufficiently well. And making this speech, he was able to acknowledge there were going to be hard times ahead. And so, while you look at the speech now and you think that's not entirely what you'd expect from somebody who's just won the war, you understand it far better when you understand his character and the kind of things that somebody would do in that situation. When VE Day finally happened, George and his family were in the palace and this great cry went up, we want the king, we want the king. And I think that although he was overawed by it, and although obviously being a naturally shy and retiring man, it was a lot for him to take on, it was still a recognition that over the course of the Second World War, he had gone from being this figure who had been regarded with a sense of suspicion, a sense of distrust almost by the public who had preferred his brother, to being this lauded figure along with Churchill who was there on the balcony with him. But, but the two men were seen as absolutely indistinguishable in terms of their contribution to the, to the war effort, in terms of importance for the British national character, and I think he, he ended the war in an exceptionally popular monarch. Then the King and Queen appear for a great reception, with Princess Elizabeth, now 19, and Princess Margaret Rose, now 15 years old. Today, Britain, emerging from the war with a proud sense of duty well done, faces the grave problems of peace. I think it's fair to say that the two things that destroyed George's health and led him to an early death were first of all his becoming king at all, and secondly the sheer stress of what he had to do in World War II, because if a, if a war had never happened, if a peace had been sought with Hitler that had then been agreed, he may have lived longer, but he was faced with the most horrendous stress and pressure. You can understand why, if you've been faced with that level of trauma, it's not going to be something you can walk away from very easily. George VI, uh, who had, as a young man, often suffered from ill health, um, became quite ill as a result of the, the Second World War. The stress of the conflict told on him he was a heavy smoker, uh, and by 1945 uh, his, his health was actually very poor. George knew that he was very ill towards the end of his life. He knew that he was a committed cigarette smoker. He was somebody who had always drunk quite heavily as well. He was somebody who knew that his health was not great. But on the other hand, he was being told by his doctors that operations that he'd had were successful. I mean, he had, he had a large portion of his lung removed, that he was going to be okay. So the fact that he was dying was kept from him, but it was also commonly known within the wider echelons of the courtiers that he didn't have all that long, that Elizabeth was likely to become queen far before anyone could have reasonably expected. George had been preparing Elizabeth to one day succeed him as uh, the British monarch and as head of Commonwealth. The way he'd done this is to, to essentially demonstrate to her uh, what the role of monarch required and also give her opportunities to, to, to begin to develop uh, her own public role. Um, for example, her position in the, the ATS at the end of the Second World War was a, a way that she embraced a new public role, demonstrating that she was committed to, to service and duty. Uh, a number of other roles fo followed. She would accompany uh, her parents on, on tours uh, during the, uh, the immediate post-war years, uh, where she went out and, and was learning, if you like, the ropes of how to be young and royal. Knowing that she would someday be queen, George VI taught his daughter everything she needed to know about being monarch and the head of the armed forces. But when the young princess embarked on a tour of Kenya with her husband in 1952, she never expected to return as queen. It was in Kenya, at the Royal Hunting Lodge, that the news of the king's death reached his daughter. When she returned from a night in the forest, it was to learn that she is now the queen, acceding to her father's throne immediately. There is no break in the continuity of the British monarch. It was her own decision to return at once to London. 
unfortunately, the king's premature death cut short this, this kind of royal apprenticeship. And ultimately, the queen was ill-prepared for, for what she had to do after 1952. Queen, his daughter, the widowed queen, his wife, as George VI returns to his sorrowing capital. And with it, on the oak coffin, is the white wreath of his widow. Because, I mean, he was, a, he was a young man when he died, when he was in his 50s. He was the youngest king to have died in recent memory. It was an enormous shock for Elizabeth. I mean, she hadn't expected her father to die. You don't want to sentimentalise these things because you don't want to make it look as if it's, you know, a, a heartbroken queen. But she was a relatively young woman, recently, recently married, and she lost her father. And in addition to personal loss, she knew she was going to have to become queen. I think that was an incredible moment because you know at that stage that you've got to change your entire life and you'll never have your own life again. this day draws to its close, I know that my abiding memory of it will be not only the solemnity and beauty of the ceremony, but the inspiration of your loyalty and affection. I thank you all from a full heart. God bless you all. The late king's daughter became England's second Queen Elizabeth. Carefully reared to her responsibilities, she has already captured the affections of Britons during her short reign. The public reaction to George VI's death was absolute horror. It hadn't been known that he was ill to the extent that he was. It was felt that he was, he'd had some bouts of ill health, but he'd recovered. The press had been very carefully t briefed about not putting in any details of various operations he'd had. And it was felt also that his death was, in a sense, it was as if Churchill had died. It was as if this great hero, this, this person who'd led them through the war had gone. And I think there was a, a sense of uncertainty as, as to who Elizabeth would be, as to what kind of queen she'd be, this young woman who, her, the highest profile thing she'd done would be to, have been to get married and to make a few speeches, but she wasn't a known quantity. And I think, again, as at the end of 1936, there was a real sense of what happens next, what happens now. Through the long years, she had grown amongst us, one of us. The little girl we knew has become Queen Elizabeth. The love we gave her has become allegiance. We knew her and we found her good, perhaps beyond our deserts. Then as Queen, she remembered those who had brought her swiftly and safely on her sad journey. She and her husband. There was a real sense of shock when George VI died, not least because he was still such a young man, only in his 50s. Uh, the king had not started off as a very popular figure uh, when he came to the throne in late 1936, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he was associated with the war effort. He had demonstrated that he was dutiful, that he was diligent, and, and through that, he had earned their loyalty and affection. Then came the war. The king had a sad and weary task to perform. Wherever his people suffered, he came, and by his presence brought comfort and assurance in their ordeal. And when victory crowned our arms, the king led our rejoicing. It was the king who opened our year of festival, but we did not know then that his serious illness had already begun.
Operation on the King, we read, and knew how ill he was. But success seemed to crown the skill of the surgeon. But now the king is dead, peaceful. I think we can see throughout George VI's reign, there's a pattern. There's this incredibly difficult thing which has to be overcome. George was not felt to be up to it. And then for a combination of strength of character, listening to people, and sometimes just luck, it always was overcome. And that was a fascinating run of luck, if you like. He came into power when the crown was in a time of crisis and steered the country through a turbulent time when the world was in the midst of change. Through the chaos of war and the founding of the Commonwealth of Nations, King George became a figure of hope and stability for peoples throughout the world. The legacy of this reluctant but rightful king is one of outstanding resilience and duty to his role as king. I think that the greatest legacy of King George VI is actually his daughter. I think that she has always, she's always reigned very much as her father's daughter. She's reigned as somebody who has prized constancy, stability, good humour, an ability to connect with people in a way that they've always found reassuring, and also a sense that monarchy has to be something of continuation. The Queen has never been somebody who has seen the monarchy as an opportunity to showboat, unlike her uncle. She's seen monarchy as a duty and I think that is very much her father's influence. He was faced with the most horrendous situation that anyone he has faced with in the 20th century, and he was a successful king during it. And despite his ill health, despite his stammer, despite his shyness, despite his character, he was able to instill in his children, especially his eldest daughter, a sense that this is how you conduct yourself, this is how the royal family has to behave. And we see his influence every day today. Eight years ago, I heard moving words which my father spoke when he unveiled the statue of King George V which stands by the Houses of Parliament. I did not think then that in so short a time I should be called to take his place. But it is with pride that I unveil this noble statue today. In his broadcast, and his visits to the Empire and to Commonwealth countries. He made himself a friend to his people all over the world. 